So for this evening, we're going to look uh, in depth again at just one particular verse, perhaps the most remarkable verse about prayer in the whole of the Bible. We're going to look at Matthew 17 and verse 20, where Jesus says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Faith that moves mountains. It's always good to see a verse in its context. The context here is that the disciples have failed to drive a demon out of a boy. And they asked why uh, they had not been able to drive out that demon when Jesus came in uh, along and immediately commanded the demon to leave and it left the boy. Uh, and Jesus' explanation was that it was to do with, with faith. And that leads to this saying, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you. There's a very similar saying later on in Matthew 21, where Jesus talks about faith again. He's just brought down a curse on a fig tree, which was not bearing fruit. It shouldn't have been bearing fruit. It wasn't the season for figs. Nevertheless, as an act of prophetic symbolism on his way into Jerusalem, Jesus cursed the fig tree and it withered and died. And the disciples said, how did this happen? And Jesus replied then, truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Another amazing promise about prayer. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for. If you have faith and do not doubt. But how are we going to understand these wonderful promises about prayer when they don't seem to fit with our personal experience of prayer? In, indeed, they don't necessarily fit with the experience of the church through the ages. We're not aware of any examples of Christians praying and mountains moving and throwing themselves into the sea. So how are we going to understand these scriptures? What does Jesus referring to when he talks about moving mountains? We've seen in Sermon on the Mount examples of hyperbole, exaggerated language to make a point, making it memorable. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Exaggerated language to make a point. Is this hyperbole? Is, is Jesus talking about moving mountains um, as an extreme example of something which isn't meant to be taken literally? Or was he tapping into an existing saying? Um, we're not aware of an existing saying amongst the Jewish rabbis at that time. Um, there's no parallel uh, to moving mountains. But, but later on uh, in the following centuries, the writing of the Jewish rabbis would talk about moving mountains as feats of an exceptional, extraordinary, impossible nature. So maybe it was a saying which his hearers would have understood as um, a label for doing amazing, even impossible things. Maybe the, the metaphor of moving mountains uh, is just a, a statement about dramatic situations. We find that uh, in the Old Testament, we find it in Isaiah, Isaiah 54 verse 10, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Isaiah isn't envisaging literal moving of mountains, but extreme situations. 
or Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Perhaps then Jesus was using moving of mountains to describe dramatic situations without necessarily literally thinking of a mountain being uprooted and moved into the sea. Or perhaps it was a promise which could conceivably be literally fulfilled by praying, believing Christians. But to look at the promise, we need to see, is there any condition imposed on this prayer, this believing prayer? I think we can find that there are actually three conditions from the context of what Jesus is saying. There's another saying in Mark 11, where it's clear that there is a condition of forgiveness. Have faith in God, Jesus said. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That's Mark's version. Uh, of Matthew 17. But the context <clears throat> leads on in verse 25 of Mark 11 to talk immediately about forgiveness when you stand praying. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. The context implies Yes, there are wonderful answers to prayer, as long as when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, you've forgiven them. There's another example of that in Luke 17, verses 5 and 6. The apostles say to the Lord, increase our faith. And he replies, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Not quite as big as a mountain, but still things flying through the air, uprooting. But the context again is forgiveness. The verses before, watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in the day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. This is a, a theme in many places in the New Testament and we saw it in the Lord's Prayer this morning in, in Matthew 6. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But just as does seem to say, Jesus does seem to say in many places, that there is a connection between receiving answers to prayer and forgiving other people. And forgiving is just as much a part of discipleship as being forgiven. So there's the first condition on answers to prayer, forgiving other people. And then there's another very clearly here. In every one of the examples of promises about prayer, they are promises where the word you is in the plural and not in the singular. We don't always see that uh, reading it in our English translations. Uh, we can so often read a verse where it talks about you and think that's me personally, individually, you singular. But in fact, so much of the Bible is not written to you singular, but to you plural. And so many of the promises about prayer have you in the plural. In other words, you together, you Christians praying together in united prayer. That wonderful promise in Matthew 18 verses 19 and 20. Truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, 
it will be done for that by my father in heaven for where two or three gather in my name there i am with them that there is greater power when christians join in prayer together when we gather together to pray the promises are not just for us as individuals they are especially for us praying together another passage from the sermon on the mount which we'll come to or skim over in the next week or two ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds the one who knocks the door will be opened um, i've made the point many times that it is a present continuous imperative keep on asking keep on seeking keep on knocking everyone who keeps on asking receives the one who keeps on seeking finds the one who continues to knock the door will be opened don't think i've ever made the point before that there in that wonderful uh, two triplets talking about prayer you is plural you together ask the verb is is a plural verb and it will be given to you plural the promise of effective prayer says dick france my old professor is made to the united praying community rather than to the private interest of the individual the united praying community and perhaps one of the reasons we don't see mountains moving into the sea certainly in our own prayer lives is that we don't pray enough together what else can we say about this wonderful promise of answered prayer talks about faith and not doubting what is faith martin luther defined faith as a living daring confidence in god's grace so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times having confidence that we're prepared to go out on a limb for god trusting that he will answer our prayers it's ascribed to abraham lincoln although uh, the quote's been used by others as well faith is not believing that god can because anybody with any faith believes that god can but it's about trusting that god will act in our situation again dick france explains it this way faith is not an intellectual commitment to the truth of an idea so much as practical confidence in god's power and willingness to respond trusting god that he will answer our prayers so when jesus promises nothing will be impossible for you whatever you ask in prayer god will give it there are these three conditions the condition that we are in good relationships with other people we are we are forgiving them uh, remembering that it is a promise to the gathered christian community praying together and not just to individuals and that it is about trusting god having faith it was uh, the missionary Hudson Taylor who said you don't need great faith just faith in a great God and that is very clear in that saying about faith as small as a mustard seed these promises about prayer are not just to those who have great faith but even to those who have the smallest amount of faith in jesus time a, prov a mustard seed was was a proverb for something incredibly small anything less than faith of a mustard seed would be no faith at all the smallest amount of faith so it's not about how much faith we can work up you don't need great faith but great faith in a great god Again, Dick France says in his commentary on Matthew, faith is not a measurable commodity, but it's a relationship. And what achieves results through prayer is not a superior quantity of faith, but the unlimited power of God on which faith, any faith,
can draw. It is the power of God which our prayer releases and we don't need great faith, just faith in the greatness of God. So what else can we say? Jesus says nothing will be impossible for you. And as we look at this scripture, four verses there from uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke, indicating that God will answer the prayers of his believing people. I don't find anything within these verses to suggest that God will not answer every prayer, however improbable, as long as we're fulfilling those conditions of forgiveness. We remember that it is us as the church praying, you plural, not just you singular, not just the individual. And where there is true faith, true daring confidence in God's grace. I don't find anything in these verses to qualify those promises, to moderate those promises. They are amazing promises. But we do have to recognize that answers to prayer are not universal. Sometimes in our experience, we pray fervently together as a church for things. And it seems that God answers no. And if we're to understand these verses on prayer, we have to realize that they are moderated. They are, uh, do have to be understood in the context of the rest of scripture. And it's not anything in these verses, particularly Matthew 17 and 20, nothing in the verse that suggests our prayers will not be answered, but rather it is looking at the rest of scripture. And this verse, these verses need to be held in tension with other passages, with Jesus unanswered prayer in Gethsemane when he prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. That prayer had the answer no, yet not as I will, but as you will. We have to understand that sometimes, however much we are convinced that we know what God's will would be when we make our requests, God will say no, because his sovereign, omniscient will, will be different from what we are asking for. Or Paul's prayer about his thorn in the flesh in, in 2 Corinthians 12. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. There are other scriptures which suggest that there may be times when God's answer to our prayers will be no. But there's nothing at all in Matthew 17 and verse 20. Nothing in the way that we understand that verse suggests that it is not a promise for us to claim, a fantastic, wonderful invitation to prayer. Jesus invites us to pray, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move, nothing will be impossible for you. So why don't we see mountains moving? Well, perhaps James 4 and verse 2 puts it best. You do not have because you do not ask. We don't pray enough. We don't pray together enough. As Lynette was reminding us this morning, a revival comes from small groups of Christians joining together to pray. You do not have because you do not ask. We need to learn more about asking, about this faith as small as a mustard seed. Nothing will be impossible for you, Jesus said.